All right. If by chance you're looking for Lloyd Williams, he is on. Oh, there. Okay. That's who I was looking for. Wonderful. I've, I've, I've been on. Okay, great. Well, good. Thank you for uh, revealing yourself. Um, well, so if we have Mr. Williams, we're ready to get started. Um, I'm Andy Rich. I'm Dean of the Colm Powell School. I want to welcome all of you. Um, the Colm Powell School is the School of Social Sciences here at City College. And, um, and I want to welcome you to this important conversation, Uprising in Context, the struggle for racial justice in the United States. The unwarranted deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, join a long history of racist violence in the United States. These deaths have galvanized the American people. They've sparked a torrent of national protest and public demonstration. And it's all too common for racial injustice to manifest as racial violence, systematized by the very institutions that are charged with serving to protect our civic spaces. So we join the call for systemic change. We lift up all in our community, our students, our faculty, our staff, and our alums who are leaders in organizing for progress. And we come together for conversations like this one about how we got here and about how we move forward together. This is an event co-sponsored by the Colin Powell School and by the Office of the President. And as we begin today, I'll just say this. This school and this college understand the struggle for systemic change in our society. We were founded on the premise that institutions can bring positive change in our world, not just impair it. And the history of this place, while it is far from perfect, points to that project as one that requires conversation and the engagement of ideas, but also concrete organizing and action. The project is about changing institutions and it is about shifting power. And that's what CCNY and the Colin Powell School exist to try to achieve in this city and in this nation. So thank you all for being here today. We will have a discussion that is led by some of our faculty and by leaders from the community. The event will be um, finished with closing remarks by President Boudreaux. A couple of just very quick logistical items. Um, during the panel discussion, we're gonna have plenty of time for questions and for engagement by the audience. And I wanna encourage you to share your comments and to share questions in the chat space. We will draw questions from that space during the second half of the panel discussion. We have, or we are muting everybody and we ask that you remain muted during the event. Um, and I also just wanna let you know that we're recording the event so that those who can't be with us right now will have the chance to view it in the future. So with that, I want to begin by introducing Mr. Lloyd Williams to share opening remarks. Mr. Williams is president and CEO of the Harlem Chamber of Commerce, an organization that since 1896 has been at the center of political, artistic, social, and economic progress in our community. Mr. Williams is also co-chair of President Boudreaux's executive advisory board here at City College. Lloyd Williams has been a leader throughout his career in advancing the rights and the power of Black Americans, and particularly all those in this community, Harlem. In a myriad of ways, he has brought progress to Harlem, and he has done it by bringing people together and insisting that we all be involved in making our voices heard. His family has been in Harlem for five generations, and he calls Harlem, quote, the most special place in this country. As he has said before, wherever you go in America, you will not find a community that is better known than Harlem, whether it's for history, politics, or it's music. If you know there are people of color in America, you have heard of Harlem. And as one person who interviewed Mr. Williams recently said, Lloyd Williams is not just a prominent figure in the community, but also a leader and a role model. The hallmark of success is uncanny. His accolades permeate the hearts and the minds of the Harlem community. Mr. Williams, thank you for being with us today. Let me turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I will uh, seek to not consume much of your time. I want to begin by uh, giving uh, recognition and tribute uh, to the partnership provided by uh, and the leadership demonstrated by uh, Dr. Vincent Boudreaux. Uh, I'm very proud to serve as the uh, chairperson of the president's uh, executive advisory board. Uh, and in the years that I have gotten to know President Boudreaux, I can truly say 
that he uh, has become uh, uh, first and foremost a friend of mine and my family, but most importantly, we have included uh, President Boudreau increasingly in key uh, points of interest uh, related to uh, the uh, state, the region, nationally and internationally. President Boudreau and I have in fact traveled internationally together uh, to uh, share uh, the mission of the Colin Powell School and that of City College of New York. And I think the dramatically highly of President Boudreau. Let me then move on. Um, as um, the uh, uh, poet writer Langston Hughes said, as goes Harlem, so goes Black America. And when he said that uh, at that time, Black America included African Americans, Hispanics, Caribbean Americans, um, and beyond. Uh, and so wherever you go on the face of the earth, if they know that there are people of color in uh, America, uh, invariably they've heard of Harlem. And so that which we do in Harlem resonates in Cicero, Illinois, Southside, uh, Chicago, uh, Watts, LA, uh, New Orleans, East St. Louis, the South Bronx, uh, Kingston, Jamaica, and far beyond. So when we talk about Harlem, we are talking about a Harlem state of mind. And I particularly connect this uh, to uh, Colin Powell, uh, who, uh, as you uh, probably know, his family uh, resided in Harlem. And uh, his origin uh, is from the country, the nation of Jamaica. So some of these connecting linkages is what we are talking about. So let's just talk about where we are today. History um, has been my love of life. Um, I, I eat it, I consume it, I teach it. And I want to share my uh, view that this time, 2020, uh, and these few months are the most critical moments in the history of America uh, since the Civil War. I want to repeat that. I'm convinced that this time is the most critical moment in the history of America since the Civil War. We have over the next few weeks and couple of months, a uh, conversion of five basic points. Clearly, COVID-19 um, and the uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of persons. I think we're all comfortable in understanding that before uh, this year is out, um, we will probably be close to a number of 200,000 uh, deaths in this country, recognizing that 100,000 took place in a three month period. But most importantly, those numbers are significantly and drastically undercounted. They do not uh, uh, take into account those who passed away in their homes. Uh, they do not have an accurate understanding of those who passed away in nursing homes and senior centers. Uh, they do not have an accurate um, understanding of those who are homeless who have passed away and they are absolutely dramatically off. Uh, in, and we may never get the true number of those who pass away in the penal system, whether it's jails, prisons, penitentiaries, and of course, uh, the dramatic undercount, uh, those who pass away in, uh, in the, uh, who are Native Americans. Uh, so when those numbers come, the COVID, so that's point one. And now we have what I call the pandemic within the pandemic, and that is institutionalized racism. Uh, George F uh, Floyd 
and the national impact and international impact we are seeing. Then we next have the political divide that is being aggressively promoted, particularly out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The next component is, of course, uh, the November elections and what's going to happen uh, at, uh, in November. All of these things are converging at one time. And then there's this factor that is frightening, and that is a long, hot summer. A long, long, hot summer in America, where our children have been out of school, uh, in some instances, for half of a year. Uh, they have death in their families, uh, in their neighborhoods. Um, there's illness in their families and neighborhoods. And there's no one to tell them what to do because they cannot come to any of us for direction because none of us have experienced this. And so what's happening to our children? And now we are looking at the long, hot summer, and there are very few jobs available for them. There's despair around uh, the nation and in their communities, and the possibility of an explosion, which I hope never happens, uh, but certainly we would be ill-advised and not to uh, keep our eye on that. And so we've done a couple of things to, so that I can finish and let you move on. Um, in Harlem, we have uh, created that which we call the Second Harlem Renaissance Commission. Uh, the name comes from the fact that this year, 2020, is the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance. And so with that in mind, we are looking at what, how do we move forward from this point? And we put two task forces uh, together with the Second Harlem Renaissance Commission, one dealing with short-term uh, initiatives, uh, rapid fire, what's happening today with unemployment, what's happening with health discrepancies, uh, what's happening with small businesses, et cetera. But even more important is the long-term agenda in terms of uh, creating a blueprint for the future, because there will be another pandemic. It may be called a hurricane. It may be various things, but how are we gonna prepare for the future? And the major reason for putting together this commission is to uh, say to Southside Chicago, uh, to say to New Orleans, uh, to say to Watts, you guys have to start planning for your future. And we can no longer continue to expect that others are going to plan for us uh, because we have uh, a demonstration of what has existed because we have not planned for ourselves. So be very clear when I say we. Um, in Harlem, Harlem is an international community. Uh, it is made up of, of course, African Americans and Caribbean Americans and Hispanics. Uh, but there's the Jewish community, and there's the Greek community, the Irish community, the Italian community, uh, the Korean communities, and all of them need to come together to be part of the commission to plan for the future. What is good, the new norm going to be uh, with how we plan housing and how we plan public spaces, et cetera? And then lastly, uh, we are inviting you to contact uh, Dr. Boudreau because in August we're going to have an international COVID-19 um, impact summit where we're going to bring people from around the world and, of course, the region and from our communities to talk about why was there such a disproportionate impact on, on communities of color. Uh, and what do we need to do to make sure that we're better prepared um, for whatever comes about in the future? So that's an overview of what we're doing. Uh, we'll be, anyone wants to reach out uh, to me, they can do so by going to lwilliams at harlemdiscover.com. That's lwilliams at harlemdiscover.com or call uh, 212. 
7200-212-862-7200. And we would love to hear from you. We would like to get your advice, your recommendations, your thoughts, your questions. And I turn uh, the, the program back over and I close by thanking Dr. Vincent Boudreau for his outstanding leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for being with us and for your leadership and your partnership with City College. Um, I now want to turn it over to Bobby Darival. Bobby is the Executive Director of the Colm Powell School's Master's in Public Administration Program. He began that job just seven weeks ago. He has never been on campus. He's never been to his office, but he has hit the ground running and he has brought energy, vision, and leadership already to our MPA program. And he's played a major role in helping us to plan this event. So Bobby, thank you. Let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bobby Daraval. I am the executive director of the MPA program at the Colin Powell School of Civic and Global Leadership. I'm very excited to be a new member of the CCNY family and couldn't be more honored to be moderating this event. As Andy, as Andy mentioned before, the public, the public demonstration sparked by the racial violence displayed in the recent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless more has rattled our collective conscience. Today, we hope to open up a dialogue, ask some hard questions, and start laying the groundwork for transformative community engagement. We are joined by three wonderful panelists. Dr. Asele Angel Ajani, who is a writer, professor, and is director of Women's and Gender Studies at City College. Michael J. Garner, president of 100 Black Men and chief diversity officer at the Metropolitan Transit Authority. And Dr. Vanessa K. Valdez, professor and director of Black Studies at City College. I'm really excited to have you all together for this conversation. We will have a free flowing conversation with questions I prepared for our panelists for the next 30 minutes or so, followed by Q&A with our attendees. We encourage our audience to write in their questions, comments, and remarks using the Zoom chat feature throughout this conversation. Debbie Chang, our Director of Fellowships at the Colin Powell School, has volunteered to monitor the chat so we can gather your questions towards the end. Let's jump straight into the panel discussion. The frame for today's conversation is America's struggle for racial equality. So my first question, racial inequality has a long and tortured history in America. Based on your lived experiences, your research and your own activism, how do you make sense of our current inflection point? Asele, I'd love for you to kick us off. Let me apologize for um, a uh, poor internet connection. So, um, so apologies for that. Um, also, I wanted to thank everyone who's joined, um, especially people from outside of uh, CCNY and also across the pond. Hi, Julia, thanks for joining. Um, so quickly, I just wanted to say that I think um, that uh, the a question that I read from you, Bobby, was a question about what is um, racial justice and what is um, and how and and where where we are at right now. I think that the the problem that we face right now is that we um, are living through um, an absolute for for Black people. I think that we are not surprised by the events that have occurred. Right. I think that um, what we are to quote um, people in my family and my friends' families is um, black and tired. And we are tired of seeing this level of violence and abuse um, done to our communities, not just in the form of police abuse, but also in the form of, of this pandemic that uh, communities. Um, Quote, folks who were organizing around um, Michael Brown's case many years ago, um, you, Black folks who live in communities that are highly sur surveilled are, we, we protested time and time again from Michael Brown to Eric Garner. We make small incremental changes, but nothing really occurs. And I think that 
all of us are tired of, of seeing this. We see that, you know, the DOJ, every time we have a case like this, what they end up doing is they find constitutional um, violations across the board in police departments. We, we make these changes, supposedly, and then what happens is that nothing changes, right? So um, I'm going to stop there. I have a lot. Thank you so much. I want to hear what other people have to say. Thank you, Asele. Uh, I will leave it to the other panelists to please uh, give us your perspectives on, on where we are now. You know, this, this is Mike, Mike Garner speaking, and I would, I would like to also thank uh, Dr. Boudreau for having this very, very important panel discussion. So kudos to his mm -hmm. effective leaders, uh, leadership. Uh, they say that leaders lead in a crisis or during a crisis, and, and, and President uh, Dr. Boudreau is doing just that. Uh, let me speak from the founding chapter of the 100 Black Men, the vice president and chief diversity and inclusion officer at the nation's largest transportation uh, network in North America. But I will also speak on, on behalf of the Garner family. Uh, Eric Garner was my cousin. And so just, just this past weekend, I was on, on, on Israeli news via Zoom. And the moderator asked me a question. Um, did we learn anything since 2014 when Eric Garner was, was, was killed? And the answer is yes, we, we learned because the leadership in Minnesota immediately fired the officers, indicted them, and arrested them. So as opposed to taking Eric Garner's mother and the family through five years of um, seeking justice and the officer lost his job and his pension, and now he's suing to get his job back. If the leadership here would have fired him on the spot and arrested and indicted him, it would probably have been a better outcome. And so that's a lesson learned uh, from 2014 to now 2020. We, we are living in, in perilous times. Um, I, I liken this period to the turbulent 60s with the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Robert F. Kennedy being assassinated, the Vietnam War, protests in the streets, Kent State University where those students lost their lives. And my, my, my grandfather would always say that if you live long enough, everything in life comes full circle. And as the black community, we sometimes fall in the habit of fighting generational battles and losing the war. Because every 10, 20, 30 years, we are fighting the same battles um, and not winning that war. And so we need to focus on not only this moment, which has evolved into a movement. So for example, when Eric Garner was killed, that was the emerging of Black Lives Matter. Fantastic, because it's the younger generation now getting involved in civil rights protests and driving effective, efficient change. We need to come up with a solution that's going to allow us, the Black community, to evolve to mainstream America like anybody else in this society. And it's amazing that we are sitting here talking in the Fortune 500 capital of the world, but yet we have extreme pockets of poverty in this city. The South Bronx, the Bronx County is the third poorest county in the nation. How is that possible by having all these corporations with billions of dollars of assets and yet you can drive across the 138th Street Bridge and you will enter the third poorest county in the country. You know, I just think that we need to take this moment, institutionalize it, great minds coming together and creating sustainable solutions which will eradicate poverty and racism. So thank you, thank you to uh, President Boudreau, to Andy, to everyone who was on this call. Um, I appreciate Lloyd Williams uh, speaking about reconstruction, right? That moment where there was a concerted attempt at some point to expand, right? To make right what was happening and expand our definition of citizenry and our ex expand nation, right? And we know what happens that that experiment 
went horribly wrong, not because there was no will at the time, but the will of white supremacists at the time was greater. We are a country that is built on a capitalist, white supremacist, patriarchal structure. And so the idea that this is somehow new, as, as Asali said, like, I mean, if you are black in this country, this, this is the ongoing battle, right? This is not, not, not only is it not new, it is existentially exhausting, right? If someone reads Claudia Rankin's Citizen, where she has a litany of just both micro and macro aggressions um, of racism, you can understand like how this is every single moment, right, of one's existence. And so the fact that we are in a, a moment, partly I think in due, due to the fact that because of the pandemic, because there are no movie theaters, because you can't turn on, you know, Sunday uh, or Monday night football, because you can't watch the baseball, because there's no distraction at the moment. And people were horrified in witnessing a modern day lynching, right? But we know that this happens all the time, right? Sadly, right? But it is not a surprise. We don't, you know, we, we, we don't, acknowledge that we are currently on Lenape lands. We don't acknowledge enslavement in this country. We don't acknowledge on a formal level, not those of us who teach it in our classrooms, but in an institutional level, there is a reason that up to 80% of industries across the board are mostly white men, right? That's white supremacy. White supremacy isn't just the KKK. White supremacy is what do our institutions look like? Who heads them? How is power shared, right? And so the moment that presents itself at this moment is one of a complete reconsideration, right? Of how we envision what we want this country to look like. Wow, thank you so much for, for starting us off and sharing um, these valuable perspectives. Um, you know, so much of what we see, um, which is all too common, sometimes it's death by police or it's death by vigilante. Um, and, and typically it's framed as bad apples versus a bad system. Um, so what I wanna do is give an opportunity, um, and Vanessa, I would love to start with you to kind of unpack, you know, this concept of white supremacy, racial inequality, and, and, and social justice. What, what are these terms and, and how do we grapple with these different concepts? Yeah, so I, want, I actually want to start with when you just spoke now about the police, right? So the roots of the police are in slave patrols in this country, right? I.e. groups of people who were, who were hired to make sure that property, i.e. enslaved bodies, were not, were, were under control. They could not self-liberate. Like that's the, that is our, that, that, those are the roots of the police. And so when we have these questions, in this country historically, right? So when we have these questions about, well, you know, I think for many of us, I, I just did a, a, an independent study this, this past semester and what my student and myself, what was hard for her to grapple was because she could, we were talking about racial disparities, we talked like across, again, medicine, health, uh, I mean, in, uh, in bank loans, sentencing disparities, right? Again, across the board. And she could not, when we talked about within the healthcare system, she could not understand, she couldn't grapple with it. And I said, well, one view is that we are not human. Meaning, right? Again, and this is, if, if anyone reads decolonial theory, Sylvia Winter, Franz Fanon, right? The idea that when we talk about the order of man, when we talk about post the enlightenment era, right? How we define man, how we define rationality, how do we define logic? Peoples of African descent, and most peoples, quite frankly, who weren't on that continent, well, even though there were people of color on that continent, um, they did not fit as for the defi those definitions. Right? thereby enabling and, and facilitating an expansion of an enslavement system. Right? And so if you grapple with that, our very definition of humanity, do we fit there? 
right? Now we, as people of color, as people of African descent, as black peoples, we know that we do. But it is obvious to me that when we look at sentencing disparities for same crimes, when we look at um, housing disparities, redlining, all of those inheritances, right? The, what Tadia Hartman calls the afterlives of slavery. It is quite clear that our institutions, like the electoral college, the roots of the electoral college, right? In this country, um, all of that is com comes out of a very specific historical moment in this country. And so if anything, you know, I think we are, we are in a moment of not only, yes, envisioning a future, but it is incumbent upon each of us to know what our history is, right? And to, under, and to educate ourselves and become more fluent in all of these conversations and all of this vocabulary. Wonderful, thank you. Asale and Michael, I, I wanna give you an opportunity to add anything um, to that topic uh, before we ask another question. Um, yeah, I just wanna just talk about the historical uh, nature of this country. Um, how we were built on rebellion, the, the rebellion of a British tea tax. And one of the first uprisings was a black man being killed, the second, uh, second uprising. And so when I hear people talk about, uh, we want our country back, I'm, I'm puzzled and perplexed. What are you talking about? We've, we've been here since day one. So your country, no, this is our country. Um, Let's talk about the, the, the evolution from slavery to reconstruction. W whenever black people in this nation thrive for a small period of time, there is pushback. Slavery, reconstruction, pushback. In some Southern states, as you know, there were more blacks than whites in some of those Southern states like Mississippi and Louisiana. And so when we got the right to vote, we voted in local elected officials, statewide elected officials, and governors and congresspeople. When the troops were removed from the South, that was the emergence of the Klan. There was a great documentary called Slavery, Slavery Under a Different Name or Another Name that was, that was uh, aired by, by PBS. And if you were Black, if you were black and if you were standing on a, on a street corner back in around 1905, 1906, and if the constable came and asked you for some ID and you could not produce the ID, he would arrest you. And the first person or the first company that came to bail you out, you had to work for them um, for a period of time, a year, six months, whatever the case may be. And then you, you talk about the chain gangs um, in the South. So I'm, I'm sitting here in New York City simply because of one reason, labor. My foreparents moved out of North Carolina as sharecroppers because the war, war shut off the European labor supply and blacks came up out of the South to fuel the manufacturing process. And so we rolled that into prosperity until we exported manufacturing. And so now you have all these cities, these Rust Belt cities, that are trying to figure out how they can reinvent themselves, like Pittsburgh, which reinvented itself into a, a, a actual medical corridor. So we are here because of labor, slavery, labor, um, migration, labor. And so this, this country was, was not created with us in mind, as, as everyone knows. And so we're still trying to get this thing right about how black people in this country can become, of, can become part of mainstream America. We're still grappling with that. But I would surmise, and I'm confident, hopeful, and faithful that like-minded individuals, once again, can come up with sustainable solutions that will allow us to in fact do that. And, and I, I, would, I would end by saying this, um, during the radical times of the 1960s, when there was urban unrest in the streets, the federal government created social, um, social service programs 
Model Cities, Head Start, CETA, College Scholarships, um, BEOG, SEOG, TAP, and what have you. And those of us who were students at that given point in time, from the late 1960s to the early 80s, we rolled those social programs. We, we went into the mainstream. We became employed. We, uh, we, we, we integrated some of these corporations. And government is the, the largest employer of the black community in this country because the private sector never hired us the way that they should. And we, we, we thrived until 1980, 81 with the election of, of Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan began to turn the, the clock back on all of those programs which we thrived on. So for example, City College, at some given point in time, it was free to go to City College. There, there, there was no tuition to attend City College. And so um, I'm just saying that prosperity pushback, slavery reconstruction pushback, the election of David Dinkins and then Rudy Giuliani pushback, the uh, election of Obama, eight years. Now we are being pushed back. So history has a way of recycling and repeating itself. And we're, we're almost back to, to 1980. Can, can I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, the 1960s. Um, Bobby, I know that you have um, a question that's going to be building off of what um, Michael just said. And I, but I, there were a couple of things I wanted to, to also bring up that um, to underscore something that Vanessa said, which I think is really important, which is the, the question of both white supremacy and racial violence and policing, which is sort of what we were also talking about. Um, you know, the, the question of what the U.S. is built on is really a culture of complicity and genocidal practices and policies that have absolutely decimated African and um, our history. So even if we have um, Sorry. Black folks have not had the wealth and the status in society in the U.S. since Reconstruction. So even prior to the 60s, even with all of these um, programs, we have we we see that we have not we, our progress has been very incremental, in part because of genocidal policies and practices, which have at their core the fundamental the fundamental rule to make sure that black folks and other communities of color do not advance, right? And that, and I know that sounds extreme, but let me just say that the racial violence is manifested in our culture on every possible level. So from, um, from uh, housing practices, education, the criminal legal system, voting, food ways, all of those things have at its core racial violence. And we see that through um, just the the other day, the Washington Post uh, published the report about how black folks have not advanced in this country um, since the 1960s, right? I mean, you can have a, a poor white household um, make 10 times more than the equivalent household for communities of color. And then the final point that I wanted to make, and I know you want to go to the question about Obama, I'm sure, um, but, um, but this also is under Obama. Um, what policing does and what policing has been, as Vanessa pointed, pointed to, 400 years of controlling and protecting property, Black folks as property have always served as a commodity in, in our culture, right? So we have served, so policing is a, is a tool of violence that has been um, constantly been used as an on-demand service by weak politicians to respond to social problems, right? So you have a problem. Sele, I think we are um, having some connection issues. Um, so I'm going to kind of pick up where you left off because I think this is uh, a wonderful um, kind of segue into, you know, getting 
closer to where we are now. So we see, you know, uprisings, riots, protests, these different terms that are meant to um, kind of frame, uh, you know, the, the, the public pro uh, demonstrations that we see. Um, my question to the panelists are, what is the best way to describe what we see happening abroad, both in the US as well as abroad? Are these uprisings? Are these riots? Are they protests? Do these terms in themselves actually matter in how we describe what we're seeing? Uh, Vanessa, I would love to get your, your, your top line perspective. Yes, yes, language matters. Um, and so there's a difference between a riot and a rebellion and an uprising, right? And it, I think when we pay attention to who is using this language and how it is being used, when you say something is a riot, what you're intimating is that it is an out of control situation that necessitates a force that controls it, right? That puts it, that maintain, not only that, that, that puts structure, like that quells a riot, right? And so when we see protests happening in every single one of the 50 states in, ter in US territories and across the globe, those aren't riots. Those are people standing up and demanding certain things, demanding certain things of their, of the, of what, their constitutions, what their legal documents have said, have promised to their to the citizenry in those countries. Now, citizen, right? In and of itself, right? There are folks who say, okay, well, that equals certain things. In the broadest sense, it means the people that are living in your territory. Do you have a responsibility to everyone on that land or no? And on, in, this, in the history of this country in particular, we've seen, right, uh, that that definition has been very, it's been, it started very, very, very small, right? You know, uh, and, and we, as, as women and as non-binary folk, when we learn, for example, that all men are created equal, right? When we're growing up, we think, oh yeah, that includes us. And quickly we learn, no, no, it does, it did not, deliberately. Right, it did not, and in fact, it didn't even mean all men, right? It meant land, men with property, right? Which again included enslaved peoples. So, you know, I mean, when we talk about the language that we use, you know, I, in preparation for this meeting, I was looking at the, the Charter of the Free Academy in 1847, right? And I was reminded that in 1847, slavery was still happening in this country. In 1847, in New York City, there were still peoples who were enslaved. And so I'm fairly certain that my peoples were not included when one was thinking about in the, in the founding of this very institution, they were not included under you know, the children of the working class because that is not the definition of working class in New York City at the time, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think the language that we use is critically important. I also did want to encourage Asale, if she can, she's probably trying to do this to call in at least, because she is making incredible uh, contributions to this conversation. And I feel like I don't want to miss anything that she's saying. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Vanessa. She, she did just dial in, so she's on the phone now. Okay. <clears throat> and I, Asale, can, can you hear us? I can hear you. I hope that by turning off my my video, you guys can can hear me as well. Um, um, I'm, I'm I'm but I'm here, so I'm just going to step back for just a moment um, because I I missed almost half of all, all of what Vanessa just said. Um, but so. Yeah. Well, I would love to actually engage you, Asali, because um, it's funny. We're actually segueing directly into a place where um, I think you can speak from a position of strength. Um, I have a question uh, about how do we protest safely in this, mili this age of militarized police, right? Um, what we see in these protests, in, in this uprising, in this you know, rebellion that's felt across such a diverse group of Americans, right? When we look outside and we see on our TV, on our social media uh, feeds, we see such a, a collection of all the different colors that are protesting. And you talk about violence and institutional violence. How do we protest safely? How do we protect our voice when we are trying to instigate and activate change in our communities? 
Okay, so let me share a screen with you. I'm, this is what I give my students often um, and people who I work with and organize with. So, so here, this is a quick sample. Can you see, can you all see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so for folks who are um, going to be going out to protests or organizing protests, um, documented and undocumented folks, um, here, please go to the ACLU website. Um, they have a lot to, to offer. Um, here are some highlights. So you obviously, you're in your strongest possible place when you um, are in public forums, the streets, sidewalks, etc. Private property owners, if you're doing a protest or participating in a protest on private property, um, you need to understand that you're okay as long as the owner is fine with you being there. Um, the police have to treat protesters and counter protesters equally. Um, they can allow you allow antagonistic groups to stand side by side. Um, and also remember that when you are present in any public space, you have the right to photograph anything in plain view, including federal buildings and the police. Okay, here's another thing. Um, the police cannot confiscate or demand any of your 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 phones, anything, right? Um, if you're videotaping, um, you have to, in the state of New York, you can um, you can actually both visually record and audio record the video the the situation. So um, so you're fine. Um, but it's important to know that if you are stopped or by the by the cops, do not physically try to resist an officer. The police cannot detain you without any reasonable suspicion. Um, and if you are held or stopped, if you ask if you are free to go and um, and when they say yes, just walk away. Um, if you are detained, ask the officer the crime that you are suspected of committing. Um, and know that they um, cannot, um, they can't detain you for um, any reason without um, a due cause. Okay, the last, last slide that I have here is that if you are held, you can make um, a local call. They're not allowed to listen. You have to consent. This is an important piece. You don't have to consent to any searches, okay? You don't have to consent to um, you don't have to give the police any information. You can give them their, your name, but you don't have to allow them to go through your belongings and they, they don't get to ask for your immigration papers, okay? If you do say anything, if you allow them to look through your things, they will, they could use that against you, okay? Um, they can't demand your phone. They can't demand... Sally, I think we've lost your audio. Can you hear us still? So, Hello. Michael, I would love to um, kind of pick up on um, something that you mentioned uh, with regard to um, this question of what happened in the late 1960s what's happening now, right? Is this a, the birth of a new movement? How do you see it um, kind of from where you sit? You know, I, I think so. I think um, if you want to call it a riot or uprising, I think that uh, there's signs of frustration. Um, if you want to call it a tipping point, you can. I mean, Malcolm Gladwell uh, outlined in his book that he wrote, the, the, the tipping point. Um, but, we are seeing the same type of frustration that we saw in the 1960s. Although there's different generations coming together to protest, it's the same thing that happened in 68 with, with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and H. Rat Brown and Stokey Carmichael. They were not united. Uh, they, they didn't like um, a, a, a nonviolent uh, protest movement uh, because they understood that our, our country is built upon and was created with rebellion and, and, and violence. Um, it's amazing to me, as I look at both um, Malcolm X and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, both of them wind up being executed in some, say, form or fashion. 
And so you're, you're talking about what should happen, uh, what's supposed to happen, but we all know that as, as the black community, that we're not treated fairly. We're, we're sometimes stopped for, for no reason at all. You, you call it profiling. We are, if you look back into the 1960s in Chicago, with, with the uh, assassination execution of, of the Black Panther Party, uh, Mark Clark and Fred Hampton, um, where the Chicago PD conducted a, uh, a pre-dawn ra raid and killed everybody in the apartment, including women and children. Some, some survived. That was an execution. Um, I'm not sure if it's possible to have a, a, a non-violent um, successful protest. What, what's, what's happening now is the same thing that happened in the 1960s. When CBS, NBC, and ABC started broadcasting to, to white America uh, how blacks were being treated in the South with water hoses and, and, and German shepherds simply trying to exercise, exercise their, their right to vote, um, that's when the movement was in fact created. And Dr. King, um, he, he did great work uh, with a civil rights movement, but when he spoke out against the Vietnam War and started focusing on human rights issues, that's when everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people turned to him, um, in, including, including the, the, uh, the progressive movement uh, back in the 1960s. So we are at a point in time right now where history is, is repeating itself. We are at a crossroads of whether or not we're going to benefit from everything that's happening now and once again create sustainable solutions that will allow the black community to finally engage in the economic um, uh, freedom of this country. Um, but the, that, that question remains because now everybody is reaching out to the black community with resources now. Um, just, just, just as a 100 black men, the president and CEO of Moed Hennessy uh, approved the deal for us to give $1 million in identifying small black businesses in the city of New York. So we're going to be giving out grants uh, to the tune of $5,000 for smaller minority black owned businesses and $10,000 for the, the, the larger black owned businesses as a way of um, providing relief uh, to these, these black businesses um, who are caught up in a uh, health pandemic and an economic meltdown because it was just announced yesterday that we entered into a recession in the month of February. And we know uh, the word recession in the black community, it means a depression. And now we're, we're focusing on admired and engaged in a civil rights uprising. Wow. All this information has been absolutely incredible. Uh, Vanessa, I, I would love to go to you next, but I think maybe now would be a great time to kind of open up our discussion to community questions. Um, and Vanessa, I think you could take the first stab. Debbie, thank you so much for helping us out with the community questions. Uh, I'll relinquish the floor to you to, to choose what, what you thought were particularly useful for our conversation. Sure, happy to help. And um, I'm going to try to combine a, a set of questions in order to make this a, a slightly more efficient process. Um, so I'll do my best to try and consolidate some of some of the audience's comments. Um, so as a panel has pointed out already, one way in which we see the embodiment of white supremacy is that the most powerful people in our country are white. Um, and so there have been a couple comments in the chat box about the book White Fragility. Um, Dean Perkins posted a table that shows um, that that 100% of the 10 richest Americans are white, 90% of Congress are white, 90% of governors, et cetera. But also the vast majority of teachers of our children are white, about 82%. So the question is, how can we empower our children, especially our black and brown children, when we are trusting their education to those who cannot or will not understand their everyday struggle? How can we re-educate ourselves in a way that doesn't reinforce imperialism and white supremacy? You, you know, it's simple, and I'll take the first stab at that. I'm, I'm not an educator, but uh, in my role as president of the founding chapter of the 100 Black Men, we have the ability to mentor our, our young Black men. Um, as I tell uh, our students that always 
major in something that's going to allow you to, to get your hustle on and become part of this economy, but always major in black history. So you understand who you are and from where you came from and the struggle of your forefathers and that you're not just starting this from ground zero, but there's a whole history uh, that we've been involved in in the building of this country, uh, in this nation. Uh, let me just pivot for a second to, to I'm, I was born in Harlem, but grew up on the south side of Chicago. One thing about the south side of Chicago, even today, that it's, it's the most segregated city in the country. But segregation created black wealth. And because when you couldn't go downtown Chicago to shop, you um, shopped in your own neighborhoods. And segregation created black wealth. So in 1980, if you were in um, an African country, you may have saw an Ebony magazine, uh, magazine or Jet magazine or Johnson Hair Care products. All of those products were manufactured out of Chicago. And so at one given point in time, Chicago had more black, more black millionaires than any other city in this country because of segregation. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's my point. Um, I appreciate the point because I think the, the idea of education is one that is very pertinent to us um, at the City College of New York, not only as professors, but as an institution that has a school of education. Um, and so I wanna pivot back to, for a second, um, the history of the Black Studies program is that it was born out of student protests, right? It was born out of students demanding faculty that looked like them, curricula that reflected their lived experiences and their histories, right? Those were two of the demands, an expansion of the SEEK program, and the demands that every person, every education student takes Spanish at, ob obligatorily in acknowledgement of the fact that the students of this city right, of the public school system were black and brown students. And at the time, they were majority Puerto Rican, the, the brown was a majority Puerto Rican student population. And so the idea, for example, that every education student had to take Spanish, right, was one that was meant to uh, lend at least some kind of empathy towards that community and also to be a better teacher, right? Um, I think that when we are, how we train our, how we train our educators, Right, I, I as in my role as a professor of Spanish, I see students who are co-majoring in Spanish and education, and so bilingual education or secondary Spanish education. And so I'm very aware as a professor myself of a transparency in my own pedagogy, right? And I welcome them to question every single thing I do, right? But I should also be able to explain every single thing I do. And so when we think about the education, the enterprise that is education, decolonizing education means addressing power disparities. And that starts in the classroom, right? It starts in how are we, how are we treating our students, right? Like when we know our students, again, the students of the City College of New York, the vast majority of them are first generation college students, immigrants, working class, we know this. So if you know that your student is, is coming off of an overnight shift and they're five minutes late, you automatically fail them? Because, well, that's an absence, boom, there you go. I mean, many of us, the, the faculty, many of us were trained at either Ivy League schools, Research One schools, where when we were in college, we didn't have to do anything else but attend, that, attend class, that's it. And for some of us, we were also work-study students, right, who were, oh, I'm a first-generation college student. So what that meant, and graduate student. So what that meant is when I was in school, I was two hours away in, in New Haven, Connecticut at Yale University, but I was on the phone with my family every night. And my white colleagues who were three generations deep didn't understand how I could be on, my, on the phone every night and why I was dealing with my family issues when I should have just been focusing on my books. Right? And so that's a disconnect. Right? And we have to learn who our students are. We have to know what their lived experiences are and then adjust to what they're doing, to, to adjust our, what we're doing in the classroom. Right? So if I have, I have my, first semester, my first year here, I had planned six novels um, for, the, for my students to read. And there came a point where the students told me they could not, I asked, they weren't reading. And so rather than to jump the conclusion that, oh, well, they just don't want to read. Like I asked them, what's happening? 
And they explained to me they didn't have time to read in their lives. And so we made an adjustment, not, and one that did not sacrifice the quality of my class, but I made an adjustment. What can they do? And therefore, what can I do? What are we doing together? And so I think it is an ongoing conversation. Education is not K through 16. You know, education is through outside of the formal system. What are we reading? What are we sharing with each other? How are we doing this? Bobby, can I jump in really quick to, because, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, please, okay, go ahead. Finally. Woo -hoo. Okay, quick, I just want to build on this, the, the question of, or the issue of education. I think, too, what we need to do is hold the white folks in our lives accountable to not just allyship, okay? In this moment, this is, this is a movement beyond allyship, okay? When we talk about racial justice, you, oftentimes what happens is that, um, you know, white folks get to say, I'm, you know, or like Ben and Jerry's, dismantle white supremacy in 12, in 12 easy steps. That is garbage. Everyone needs to do the work, right? Everyone. And so, you know, the, the, problem with, the problem with talking about racial justice is that it oftentimes falls on communities of color, black folks in particular, to do the educating, to do the training, to do the labor. If I hear another person talk about how we need to look to black women to figure out how to move in these streets, I'm done, you know? I mean, no, the, the, the issue is that racial inequality, racial violence, um, it comes from, it is all part of all of our fabric and we need to address that. So white allies, you need to do your work, get your hands dirty and don't just ring them. Um, that's my, that's my point. The other thing is, is that there was, um, well, I'm going to stop there because I, I, I don't want to ruin my good streak of internet. So I'll stop. And I just, I just wanted to, to pose a question just to the audience, just for a moment to think about this. We have seen videos, clips of people, of, of black men and women dying, right? Think about the fact that we did not see the massacre in Newtown. We did not see the massacre. We don't see bodies coming back from war. We don't, so let's think about as a society, right? what we allow to be seen versus not. Because at what point does it become black, black death a spectacle? And so for me, that is a direct line. There's a direct lineage of lynching photos, right? Lynching photos were, and they were playing cards. Right? They were postcards that people shared with each other, right? To say, hey, look at what we did, right? And so that's, I, I think, on the level of doing the work, it's, it's down to that. What do we allow in our public sphere? Right? We've all been, I'm pretty sure, on a, a platform, a train platform in this city, and we've seen either uh, uh, cops that are in uniform or not talking. It looks just talking to people. And I mean, I know my reaction is like, oh man, like I get very scared. And I also know that I don't want to do anything because in doing something, I put myself at risk. Right? And so what do we allow to happen? Right? To, to Asali's point, this is not just people of color. This can't be people of color. Numerically, it can't be people of color. In the same way that feminism cannot be solely by women, right? We, of course, need men. And we need non-binary non -binary folks in this. Um, it, it has to be all of us. All right, next question. Um, can a piecemeal and incrementalist approach to remedy really make Black descendants of slaves in America whole? Or do we need to focus on more radical transformation through financial and other reparations? If modernity and education have not changed devastatingly and discrimi discriminatory mindsets of people, what will? What will it take? I just want to challenge that by saying Black people are whole. Black people are whole. We are not broken. We're not broken, we're tired, but we are not broken. That's it, I, Michael, because I just answered the other one really long. <laughs> I'll no, say, I, go ahead, Michael. You know, I, I just think that um, we, we uh, just talked about the tipping point. Um, it's gonna take everybody to, to come together to create solutions um, to our current social problems. Um, government, whites, blacks, and others uh, to come together as one 
focus on solutions. I think, I mean, is that going to be job training that, that, that leads to, to where the jobs are right now in the healthcare and, and educational industries? Uh, but it's going to take a, a collective approach and not a piecemeal approach. Um, and one thing I don't like to do, I don't like to, to engage on Zoom calls just repeating what, what is evident. Uh, there needs to be immediate action steps after the Zoom call um, so we can start the process. So, for example, uh, 100 Black men getting a uh, million dollars from Moet Hennessy to give to Black businesses. That's an action step. 100 Black men giving out $100,000 in college scholarships. And as a matter of fact, I just saw one of our students uh, that we gave college scholarships money on to. He's online because he just, just, just uh, uh, like, like wrote me a note. There has to be actionable items focusing, focusing on sustainable solutions. Michael, I agree with you. I'm, I'm, um, I think that there's there. So for example, there are people can please email me. I'm, I've got a list of things, a list of organizations that are currently looking for as much help support. Um, you can join me. We're talking about, you know, uh, prison to to college uh, pipeline work that that I do. And also um, people who are talking very adamantly and working very fervently to defund our police to abolish prison systems to change the way that the criminal legal system is operating so please email me because i i'm worried that i'm going to get cut off again um but my 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 email is um a angel ajani at ccny.cuny.edu and i'm happy to share that information with you Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to, you know, be respected, respective of time. Um, for there are so many amazing and great questions um, in the from the audience coming in in the chat. Um, I obviously think there's a lot of interest, and we can continue this conversation. And I look forward to um, continuing this conversation um, with everybody, with our full community, um, in as many different venues and avenues as we possibly could to make sure we include everyone. Um, what I want to do is give our wonderful panelists whose leadership on these issues uh, has been absolutely incredible today. I kind of want to give you all, the three of you, an opportunity in 30 seconds to a minute to kind of um, answer one final question. And hopefully um, we kind of, um, you know, wrap this up on somewhat of a hopeful note. And I, I want to ask you, you know, kind of directly, where do you see signs of hope? <laughs> okay. I'm going to be respectful. Uh, I'm, 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 I want the other two panels to go, and then I will, I will, I will speak. Um, okay. I think um, I see signs of hope in in the what I consider to be the radical call for the the changing the the defending and the redistribution of wealth. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, New York State, and please, for those of you who believe in calling your representatives, the, the mayor, the governor, you know, or, you know, if they're saying that they're going to defund education to the tune of, what is it, $600 million, and the police only getting a cut of $23 million after they've got a budget of $600 billion, or excuse me, is it $6 billion? Excuse me, $6 billion. Okay, so that's a small that 23 million is a small indent in their in the largest police force budget and we really do need to redistribute that that tax paying money okay um and that's where i see that's where i see this hope the hope going i see that you know people may you know the 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 nightly the, the nightly daily protests um voices going heard voices being people taking and challenging and risking their lives on the streets absolutely that's what i see is is the most hopeful moment in this we have five months until the elections if we believe in the elect the electoral process um we have five months we have to keep it up yeah. i too also i see um hope in the fact that you know, there are things 
in the same way that right after this president was elected, all of a sudden it felt like lots of people were paying attention to how our electoral politics work in a way that they hadn't previously. I think this is also that moment where we are paying attention to, you know, a city budget, to what is what is uh, the legal statute by which police um, are are are, are immune to prosecution, basically. Like, what is qualified immunity? What is 50A? All of those things, I mean, this is conversation now that is happening, right? Uh, in across social media platforms, on news services, you know, we're questioning again, where our money goes as a society. Who are we investing in as a society? I also do wanna say though, I mean, there are, there are certain aspects of the current conversation where we are deliver we're leaving people out. So for example, when we think about police violence, we don't necessarily think about the fact that we call the police when there's a disturbance, that someone has a mental health disturbance, right? Should we call the police for that, right? We're not talking about sexual violence in prisons at all, right? And so there's so much that we're also leaving out of this that I think both the hope is that there is conversation happening, there's educating happening, there are, uh, you know, again, across the board, there are people who are saying the words white supremacy as testimony to like how, how much we are, as a culture, as a society, we are showing that we, do, we are making the choice to say what we tolerate and what we don't. And at this moment, it looks to be that we do not tolerate racial violence in this way. I hope it continues. We cannot stop this momentum. We have to, we have to keep, keep <clears throat> it together. You know, I, I started out my comments by saying that I was on Israeli TV and the, the uh, moderator asked me if I was naive to think that this movement was going to bring about change. And I says, no, because if you understand the evolution of our nation, we're just one big experiment. Blue states versus red states, rural versus urban, white, brown, and black. Um, we went through a civil war, but I'm optimistic that like-minded people will come together. When I saw the protest, and I saw as many whites as they were blacks marching throughout the streets of this country, that's the real America that we live in. That is the real America. So I'm optimistic that we have learned our lesson uh, from 2014 to 2020, when Eric Garner was murdered, five years struggle to bring justice. When George Floyd was murdered, the leadership immediately fired those officers, indicted them, and locked them up. We've learned a very, very la a valuable lesson. Let me also say that I'm a, a Sikh graduate from SUNY Buffalo. Uh, un, under ordinary uh, circumstances, being raised in segregated Chicago, where we had eighth grade books when I was a sophomore, and I knew it was an eighth grade book because I had the eighth grade book that we were using uh, as a sophomore. I would not have qualified for college under ordinary circumstances. But the Sikh slash EOP uh, program gave me an opportunity. And one of the lessons that we can learn is that when government invests in its most precious resource, its people, um, it will be um, amounts of, of returns. For example, if you put a, a dollar number on the SEEK program and the amount of money that they gave me uh, to graduate from SUNY Buffalo in four years, if you add that money up and if you look at the amount of federal taxes that I'm paying, government invested in me and now throughout my working life, they are going to realize a return on their investment. And that's how it should be. Governments should be investing in people um, in this great nation that we live in. So yes, I'm, I'm optimistic that it's going to be a change happening because we've learned our lessons and it's going to be a great thing being part of that change as we end this call, as we fill out our census forms, as we uh, make sure that when that government funding comes from the census, that we fight for our equal shares, that we vote to vote um, this crazy president that we have out of office, and we replace Mitch McConnell uh, with Senator Chuck Schumer to lead the, uh, the uh, U.S. Senate. 
and we maintain the the uh, the majority um, in Congress, so we can control all three branches of government. That's the charge that we need to focus on as we end this call. Thank you. Thank you so much to our three incredible panelists for their perspective and for the leadership that they've shared with us today. Uh, thank you to our audience who you've all been really incredible and very engaging. There are so many incredible questions and ideas that have been left unacknowledged in the chat and we are gonna find ways to, so that we can continue this movement forward and continue this conversation. Before we close, I would like to thank the CCNY president, Vincent Boudreau. First, for sharing a timely and thoughtful memo on racism earlier last week, and for his active role in co-hosting this event. It demonstrates our college's commitment to community activism and social justice, especially now when we need empathic leadership that is critically engaged. Without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to President Boudreau for some closing remarks. Oh, thank you for that. And, 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 and thank you all for who, who took this idea and, um, and, and ran with it. Um, I wanna start by, by acknowledging and echoing you know, what President Garner and President Williams said at the top of this, um, of this forum. You know, the relationships that, that we have built with community organizations and, and with institutions like the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce and 100 Black Men, um, I think need to be defining for for uh, for CCNY, you know, I've I've been in this job for now a little more than 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 three years, and what I will say is at the very beginning of that, um, we had some 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 conversations about what the relationship between the college and the community um, needs to be, and, and and one of the things I said back then is is, is that in my now almost thirty years at City College, I never felt. Like as an institution, we were sufficiently interested enough to to embrace the 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 opportunities and also the struggles of of our neighbors in Harlem and Upper Manhattan, in Wood and Washington Heights, um, and 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 what I heard from uh, institutions like the Chamber of Commerce and leadership that that Mr. Williams provides there, or places like 100 Black Men and the leadership that President Garner. Uh, supplies there is, you know, finally, we've been waiting for the college to, you know, we've always had individuals, programs, uh, faculty members, student groups that have as in, as individuals done tremendous work uh, in, in the community. But as an institution, City College needs to be of the city and the part of the city that we are most closely allied with is Harlem and Upper Manhattan. So, so I want to thank both of them for um, being so willing to take my, uh, my initial statements of, of where we need to be as an institution and making a place for the college. You, you know, we, we do, the, the presidents of CUNY do, um, especially now during this, this, uh, this moment, we do meetings pretty much every week. And, and the last meeting we did, we were asked as, as presidents to talk about how we were doing and what our experience was. And a lot of people talked about how they were thinking about their responsibilities to their campuses and their, and their students. And I'm, I'm, I'm with them, I'm concerned about those things as well. But the thing that I wanted to talk about was that for the duration of this, of this pandemic and then the protests that, that followed after, after Mr. Floyd's killing, when there was a conversation in Harlem about what we needed to do as a people to respond to the health crisis and, and to the political uh, situation. Um, the leadership of Harlem made a place for City College in that conversation. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, Bobby, if I could, I wanna just talk a little bit about the memo that I wrote to the campus. And, 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 if, and, if, and if people didn't get a chance to see it, I wanna I want to talk about the two things I, I, I said there. Um, the first thing I said, and it, and it echoes things that Professor Valdez uh, said earlier in this conversation, is, you know, but for cell phone videos, um, but for you know, the, the, the almost incessant evidence of the everyday um, burden that people of color feel 
you know, the, 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 this, you know, microaggressions, call the cops because you're having a barbecue, kneel on somebody's neck. But for that, um, we wouldn't be at this moment. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be at the moment where a broader society um, acknowledges that despite the victories of the 60s and the 70s, despite the erection of a formal structure of, of laws, you know, equality before the law, right to vote, you know, formal desegregate. We have all kinds of rules desegregated our schools, and we have we have looked at a resegregation of American schools. You know, pretty much since those laws were promulgated, and and and, and so we need to look beyond the formal legal structure um, that was erected in consequence of the civil rights movement and begin to look at actions of people that are documented day in and day out about how those structures are thwarted. You know, the, 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 the promise of formal liberalism, of formal liberalism is we will give you a series of rules that on their face seem fair, and then we'll let everybody compete with one another under those rules, and whatever the outcome is, because the rules are there, must be fair. It must be a fair reflection of people's capacity and potential. And so if systematically um, there are different outcomes, if systematically white privilege is reproduced generation after generation, you know, that must be just how, you know, that's fair. That's what liberalism, formal liberalism says. And, and what we see in all of our ability now to, to, to show how rules are enacted we see all the myriad ways in, in, in which the, you know, whatever the intention of those rules are has been thwarted. And that's the moment we're at right now. We're at the moment where the, the, the next stage in the struggle is not to erect new rules. It's to figure out how we can drive a behavior within those rules in ways that are, that are more just. And so the memo that I wrote really makes two pledges. And, and, and the first is a pledge you know, we, we, there are many, many people on this call who are city college folks, uh, uh, staff, faculty, students. And the first pa part of that memo is a pledge that says, given where we are historically, given what the college's historic mission is, and what the failings of the formal structure of rules, regulations, and institutions are in terms of racially just outcomes, I would like to charge the college, to charge instruction that happens in the college with figuring out how to equip our students when they graduate with the tools necessary to move us towards justice. And, and, and part of that, and, and, and Michael Garner spoke to this, part of that is knowing your history. You know, part of that is figuring out you know, what their actual story is of who you are and how you got here. But you, know, you can take, you know, we're living in a society right now where basic statistical truth climate change, racial inequality, violence, basic statistical representations of the truth are undercut because we have a society that doesn't believe in statistics. They don't believe in scientific knowledge, right? And so are we equipping our, our graduates to analyze data and tell the story of that data, right? That doesn't have to be in a class specifically devoted to racial justice or history, right? Are we equipping um, our engineers and our scientists to think about the implications of how they practice their work? Are we equipping our architects to think about the built environment and what implications it has for relationships between, between advantaged and disadvantaged communities? And so my first uh, call in that memo was for every one of us who is instructing our students to think about the skills and the knowledge and the motivation to take on, you know, what I think is not just the most, um, you know, alongside climate change, the most important struggle of our day, but to make sure that the students um, understand that they're, they, they're acquiring a portfolio of skills that can be, that must be mobilized into fixing what is broken in our society. And that's the first one. The second one, though, is, is, is tied to our relationship as an institution with, with, with the community. We can't stand outside of this struggle. 
as an institution, it's not just, you know, we can't um, limit our uh, responsibility or our role or our mission to merely teaching generations of students that come through City College. We have skills, we have insights, we have resources, even now um, under the, uh, the COVID-19 inspired budget cuts, we have things to offer to the community and to the public. And, and, and I've, in my head, I've always thought that we can be two things at City College. We can be a school, you know, a place where young people come to be taught and they graduate, or we can be an institution that includes our educational function, but also gathers, mobilizes, builds on the knowledge, expertise, programs that we have, and, and, and sends them out into the world to, to find partners to do work with. Um, Mr. Williams talked earlier about the second Harlem Renaissance, and, and, and this is a, a commission that he is putting together with leaders of Harlem to think about what happens after COVID-19 and, and to think about not just how do we get back to where we were, but what is it that's embedded in the unequal structures and practices of our economy, our society, our culture that made, a, that made communities of color so vulnerable to this pandemic. And, and so the second Harlem Renaissance is both a coming back and a moving forward. And, and, and what I have pledged to do is, is to work with various uh, departments, individuals in this college, in our education school, our engineering school, the mm -hmm. Colin Powell School, to figure out how we can take the knowledge that we have on this campus um, and in partnership with, with, with people in the community, um, participate in that commission, participate in, 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 in making sure that the thing that we stand for as an institution, not as a school, as an institution, is, is a commitment to mobilizing our expertise and our resources in the service of justice. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, the, the, the statement is, is on our website. All you have to know is those two things. That, that, that I am urging everyone who teaches at our institution to mm -hmm. think about the skills that we are imparting to our young people that will allow them to be activists in this struggle, even if they never march, even if they are, they are simply at, you know, in, in the office that they are employed in at some point, mobilizing knowledge to make sure that we're moving towards justice and pledging the institution to work in close partnership with the leadership of Harlem and the leadership of, of, of New York and the activist leadership um, of our communities to make sure that, that, that we, are, we are contributing, not just as individuals, but as an institution. So I wanna thank, um, I wanna thank um, Andy and, and Deborah and, and, and Bobby and, and, and other people in, in the Colin Powell School who I, I, I know were, were agitating for, for this kind of a forum. I'm so grateful that we had such strong representation from, from our community partners, from, from Michael Gardner and from, from, from Lloyd Williams. Um, and I just, I appreciate the conversation. I hope in the spirit of my first charge, that this is that this is one of many such discussions that we will that we will host uh, in the service of of this struggle. So so thank you everybody. Great. I want to, President Boudreau, thank you very much. I want to thank the panelists, Bobby. Thank you very much for helping us put the event together, making it so rich and meaningful. There's clear interest in continuing the conversation, and Bobby, and Vanessa, and Sally. We hope others will be part of the conversation about how we move this forward. Thank you all very much for being with us today and take care. Take care.